Let me just, and yeah. just a reminder, so at the end of this, we want to have a plan, a yeah. plan on how we go right. and influence members of Congress. Um, so I don't think it's so important that we get the super details on these bills because they are going to change and don't know exactly what's going to happen next year, although Daryl and I and others have heard that members of Congress are going to be reintroducing some things. So I want to split this uh, next 10 minutes that I'm doing just to discuss some of the bills, but also how do we influence Congress and for you guys to think about what action steps you might be willing to take over the next year um, on these issues. Um, so we already talked a little bit about how we influence um, Congress. There's a, a number of ways. So I've heard people talk about uh, money. You know, money influences. Uh, donations do uh, make a difference. I heard talk, people talk about a lobby visit. Um, no one mentioned, like, oh, Gene mentioned emailing and calling uh, as a possible way. Um, I didn't hear anyone talk about the media. You know, obviously media, op-eds and letters to the editor. Um, someone talked about voting, so voting is a way certainly to influence Congress. There's, a, there's probably a whole host of other ways, but those are some key ones. Um, there's something called the Congressional Management Foundation that every year does a survey of staff to try to figure out, you know, what is the most effective way to influence um, their boss. And over and over again, it always comes to contacts, uh, especially one-to-one -one contacts with constituents. That is the way that influences Congress the most, um, and especially if those one-to-one -one contacts can be of those that are known to be influential people in their district. Um, so how many here have actually done a visit to their member of Congress and either had a talk with their staff or, or actually had a one-to-one -on -one conversation with a member maybe somewhere else? Yeah. So almost everyone here. So everyone kind of knows that that is the big game. It's the, it's the one that takes the most energy to organize a, a, a visit. But if you put it together, it's going to have the most impact. You know, rather than just one email, uh, which you know, takes lots of emails to make a difference, or phone calls, it can make lots of phone calls to make a difference. A one visit can be quite the thing. So I would love to hear at the end that people are planning like we're gonna try to do this many visits over the next year, I'm gonna take this office, you're gonna take that office, and you know that kind of a plan. Uh, but also think about these other ways. Um, other ways you can get face-to-face -face contact uh, could be going to events that members go to, uh, right? There is something called the Town Hall Project, townhallproject.com, they try to keep track of all the town halls. Um, so going to town halls may give you face-to-face if you know donors or if you're a donor yourself, you might be invited to events. You can also call the office and see if you can get on their email list of events that their members go to. You know, that gives you opportunities to get this face-to-face -face time to talk to members uh, about, about these issues. Um, so when we, get, when we get there, we're going to be talking about bills, and I'll talk a little bit, of, um, a little bit about some of these, um, some of these bills. Uh, there are a number of them that are good on nuclear weapons that are currently in Congress um, and many of which we think are going to be reintroduced. I will talk about numbers, but they, these numbers are still good. Uh, you can still talk to members and their staff until the new Congress happens, but as Bob mentioned, this is a new session. Every election comes in a new session, so all bills from the last two years are done and we get all new bills next year. Um, so I'll start with the Hold the Line Act and some of these bills you've heard earlier from the workshop that Daryl did. Um, that's H.R. 6840 um, in the House side. Uh, it does have a Senate companion, which is S. 3448, um, which was introduced by Senator Markey. On the, on the Senate side, it's just Senator Markey at this time, so it's a good opportunity for you guys to reach out to Van Hollen and Cardin. Uh, on the House side, there are 18 co-sponsors, and we understand that's going to be reintroduced next year. Um, and it's an important one because we do know that uh, uh, the new chairman that we expect for armed services, Adam Smith, this is one of his issues, the low-yield nuclear weapons. Um, so uh, buttressing him and his work in the committee with getting co-sponsors will be helpful. Uh, Mm -hmm. Sure. It's um, low-yield nuclear weapons, uh, so-called low-yield nuclear weapons. It would uh, keep, keep them from being funded. Uh, and this is a uh, new weapons that uh, 
the Trump administration has been pushing forward through their nuclear posture review. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the wheels are turning and moving it forward, but it's possible that we can um, either limit the number or stop some of the procurement, um, and that's some work that we have uh, champions on the on the Hill who are going to work on that next year. Um, the other one is uh, we talked about no first use. You might have heard of that several times, uh, that we would not have the current policy that the U.S. could have first use strike uh, to change that policy to no first use. And Representative Adam Smith also introduced something like that early this year, one of the shortest bills you've ever seen, maybe like six words. It is the policy of the U.S. that we will, you know, no first use for nuclear weapons. Um, that currently is um, H.R. 4415. Uh, it only has seven co-sponsors, mostly actually because they weren't working the bill and they weren't even taking co-sponsors until like a week ago. So if you look at the co-sponsor list, they only started last week. But that is going to either be reintroduced or for sure worked on next year. So that's a good bill to work on. Um, similar bills are the Restricting First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act. So not as strong as just saying, hey, there's no first use, we'll never use for nuclear weapons first. This says if we're going to use nuclear weapons first, Congress has to approve. Um, and there's a House and Senate version of that, S-200 on the Senate side, um, and H.R. 669 on the House side. Uh, Ed Markey again introduced that in the Senate, Ted Lieu uh, in the House. Uh, there's 13 senators on it, that's pretty significant, and 82 members of Congress. So I'm giving you lots of bills because a lot of times you want this whole menu because many of your members are on a lot of these. So just give you options of things that you could ask, ask for them to do. Um, uh, uh, who were, so peace action, I know several people might remember the name SANE or SANE Freeze, that's what peace <coughs> action is. Um, so there is a bill called the SANE Act, named after SANE. Um, smarter approaches to nuclear expenditures. It's a very like longer, more comprehensive bill. Basically, would cut a hundred billion dollars over ten years uh, from nuclear weapons spending. Um, that has been introduced every year for the last uh, I don't know, 10, 10 years in some way. Uh, maybe it's been five years. So like four or five. Um, so on the House side, it is HR two six six eight. Uh, introduced by Earl Blumenauer, and on the Senate side, it's 1235. There's three co-sponsors on the Senate, 13 on the House. Now, this bill is not something that's going to move forward anywhere. I find this bill is a good one as an educational bill, um, especially on the House side where staffers tend to change over every couple of years. This is a bill that would cause a staff to really do some deep research and look into issues. It talks about several of the triads and various things that they can cut. It's a longer bill. Um, and so it's a good educational bill um, for people to, to work on. And we know that Senator Markey uh, said he was going to reintroduce it next year, and I assume Bloom and Arrow will as well. Um, there's a couple other, uh, I would say, lesser important bills. One, uh, one is on uh, the long-range standoff weapon, and I'm going to ask you to explain That's it. That's the acronym for a new air-launched cruise missile to be dropped by a bomber to carry a nuclear weapon. So it's very destabilizing. It's a cruise missile, basically, that will have a nuclear weapon on it. People are concerned that if you were the opposition and you see a cruise missile fired, you now you can't tell if it's a conventional weapon or it's a nuclear weapon. And it's very destabilizing. Um, and they're moving forward to building that. And this is another thing that Representative Adam Smith said he might uh, work on cutting. So there are two bills um, uh, to cut the LRSO. Uh, one is S. 574, um, and the other one is HR 2667. What's it called again? Um, so the bill is actually called the Nuclear Cruise Missile Reconsideration Act of 2017. It needs a better name. I don't know what Marky was thinking, but you know. Uh, <laughs> Consider all <these>. Yes. <laughs> uh, but again, some of these bills are trying to look at peeling off one thing, you know, rather than looking at the big picture, because sometimes you get more support of like taking, take, you know, chipping away at things rather than going for the whole thing at once. Um, and I think the only one that I'm forgetting here, for somehow I got removed, uh, was Menendez's bill on the START Treaty, which I did have here at some point. Do you know the yeah, number? I pull it up. Uh, okay, I thought I had it right here, but 
I don't. Um, so we'll get that number for you in a second. Uh, Three one six nine. Um, the bill number. It is the New Start Policy Act. Of 2018, and it will be a 2019 version with a new number. But that's what it is. And um, the one last ask for people, for members of Congress, is to make statements um, or an op-ed or something in support of the nuclear ban treaty. Uh, so that's something that several members of Congress have. You want to do, check to see if they have, but they can make a statement. They can make a floor speech. Uh, they could uh, do a press release, they could tweet about it, whatever it is for them to come out and support the nuclear ban treaty is another ask. Um, the last thing that I'll mention about ask is you know, things are going to change. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in two or three months, so some of these bills will change, there will be different things, and as you get deeper into the process, there will be the amendment process. So there might be interesting amendments either on the Senate side or on the House side that we don't know about. Um, that hopefully you are connected in some way to a group that works on this, whether it's you know PSR or Peace Action or Arms Control Association. We tend to send out e-alerts around when these votes come up, and a lot of times we just don't we don't we we only know two or three days in advance what what amendments being offered or or whatnot. So those are opportunities there. Um, and then the last thing I would say to remind you that you know many many of your members have leadership roles. You know, Sarbanes is on the, uh, will be on the oversight subcommittee for national security. Um, so there's different asks that you can do for people on committee. Hoyer, we don't know what's he going to be, but most likely, unfortunately, he'll probably be the whip again uh, for the Democrats next year. That's a very big leadership, so you can work on Hoyer. Um, Holland not only is on the budget committee, but he is chair of the, uh, the DCCC. Um, so that's a, a big leadership role in Democrats. So they hold leadership roles. So getting them to stay stuff and do stuff, um, you know, can make quite a difference. Uh, what and uh, well, he's going to he will less things change. And, and again, a lot of these things haven't been called yet or are official. He will be on, um, and he's not he's not a very senior he's a senior person. So oversight committee subcommittee on national security. So specific to national security, he's doing oversight. And so, well, I know for us, and it's different for everyone. Sure. So one, you have to look at your particular member to see where they're at with these issues. So typically when we do our lobby days for peace action, we do have it kind of prioritized. And so people can <coughs> kind of know, you know, here's, here's the bills to ask. We try to limit our ask to like three ask a visit, three asks for a visit. Uh, but sometimes it's nice if you can just focus on one. Uh, but a lot of times it makes it more difficult because your member might already be on something, so you have to take a um, take a look at that. But yes, uh, by listing 12 bills here, I'm not suggesting you go in and ask for 12. You, you need to prioritize. I try to kind of do it a little bit in priority, but it will probably depend on what's happening um, at the time. Um, so I did put our website on there. I purposely did not do handouts because I know things are going to change and I also know when I go to conference I come back with a <laughs> stack of papers like this and they never get looked at. So on our website we always have um, an ask sheet um, that we keep up to date um, and that ask sheet has a number of our issues but it do, it, we usually have prioritized what we think the best asks are at that time on nuclear weapons. So you can download it. It's a PDF easy to print out. There's also a fact sheet there. Um, there's also tips and tricks on how to lobby members of Congress. How do you get the meeting? You know, how do you structure it? So all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's an activist toolkit on our website and you can just go 